we're going to continue in a message series entitled Legacy. In fact, we are concluding the series today. We're in part three of this series. And if you've missed up to date, no worries, no problem. Today is applicable as a standalone. If your curiosity is sparked at any point, you can go back and watch these messages. Uh, it's been a valuable series for us as we talk about this important, important subject matter of legacy. And so as we conclude today, let's go back and revisit just a few uh, basic thoughts and then dive into today's topic if we can, okay? So we defined legacy is not something that's just left monetarily that we inherit uh, afterwards, something that is left for someone. We've defined it as something that is left in them. It's something that is imparted into someone else, that it is impressed into someone else. If you and I, particularly the older that we get, we have a tremendous opportunity to look around us, to see the ages coming up behind us, and to invest our lives, our treasure, our experiences into those who are coming along right in our footsteps. And for a believer, if you're a Christ follower in this room, it's not just an opportunity, it's a responsibility, that we have a unique responsibility for investing into those coming after us that we looked at through the series scripture that points us to that responsibility. And last week, we kind of leaned into that idea. And so our key thought for this series has been simple, uh, is the value of a life is always determined by how much of it is given away. And so I would like to one last time say this aloud together on the count of three, okay? You ready? One, two, three. The value of a life is always determined by how much of it is given away. And that every one of us leaves a legacy. We leave something that lasts behind us. And hopefully that's a good something. And so it's not really a question of will I leave a legacy, but it's what kind of legacy will I leave? And we began this series by talking about a, a group of people that are you know, kind of uh, right there at 40, maybe even north of 40, and I won't ask you to raise your hands, but something significant happens when we start to get towards that age group, is now we've experienced enough of life that we're now positioned uniquely where we, we have more to give. The longer you live, the more you have to give. That we are now uniquely positioned, we have enough life experience that God actually starts to turn us to looking at the next generation. And so we kicked off the series and talking about legacy from the position of once I'm kind of 40 plus, what does it look like? How does that operate? How do we do this? How do we leave a lasting legacy? And, and I, I want to be clear that in that portion, a lot of times we talked about wasn't just legacy that's left for children, our own children, but it's left in those who are simply coming up alongside us, colleagues maybe, maybe it's people in the work environment, maybe it's people that are in our Bible study, in our community group, people that we do life alongside, that we have tremendous opportunity to invest into the others around us. And not just opportunity, but responsibility. I mean, what would it mean for us to, by all means, live a successful life, and yet at the end of it, not have passed on our faith, the thing that is most foundational to us? And so today I want to kind of take this in and look more at the family structure and more at the family unit. And so I want to talk to those of you who are parents and maybe you still have little ones at the house. Maybe they're, you know, they're still down here or maybe they're all the way up over here standing over you now at this point, but they're living in your home. I also want to talk to those of you who are grandparents. Maybe you have children who are still, or grandchildren who are still under your influence. You still have tremendous opportunity of investing and in shaping this generation. I want to talk to those in your room who maybe you don't even have children. Maybe one day you want to have children. Maybe currently you don't have them, but maybe you have some nieces or nephews. If you have influence in children in your life, this is going to be an, a, a growing thing for each of us, an opportunity for each of us. And then finally, those of us who are the church, city church specifically how God has called us as a church to partner with parents, to come alongside families, to leverage what God is doing in us and to do through us for a generation that's coming behind us. So in case I left anybody out, I think that encompasses all of us, all right? This is for you today, but specifically we're talking about uh, how we leave a legacy, lasting impression on our children. 
And I want to suggest a book to you. I want to recommend a book to you. Uh, it's by this guy, Dr. Tim Elmore, entitled 12 Huge Mistakes That Parents can avoid. And maybe you like to read in paperback. Maybe you want to go through and highlight some things. Maybe you're an audible kind of person. Grab that, listen to it while you're on your commute. It has valuable content inside of it. And one of the things that I want to do is I just want to kind of pull three of those, borrow from a few of his ideas for a moment as we get started today. I'm going to move over here. I think I'm cutting in and out a little bit. Uh, as we get started today, to borrow from a few of his ideas, make them our own, and what I think is so important for us as we talk about legacy, the generation that's coming behind us, and some of the things, the unique things that we're seeing that maybe we might want to reconsider. Maybe we might want to rethink how we're approaching. And so let's talk about three of this generation, meaning those who are currently leading at the helm. Let's talk about some of the unique challenges that we're facing in terms of leading a legacy. Three mistakes that parents make. And we'll go through these briefly, set up the idea, and then we'll come back and talk on the other side what it means for you and I. The first one is this, and it's that we risk too little. Uh, we risk too little. That I, I don't know about the days when you grew up, but times have changed. They look completely different. And if you're older than me, then you would say, yeah, you know what, Pastor Daniel, it's even more different than how you experienced it when you were a, a kid. So as a means of just kind of uh, a, a poll, a show of hands, how many of you would remember a time in which you either walked to school or rode your bike to school? Any of you in the room actually did that? Yeah, quite a few of you, quite a few of you. How many of you remember a time when, and, and they don't even really make these anymore because of the safety hazard of them. How many of you remember jumping off of a high dive? Anybody ever jump off of a high dive? Yeah, a lot of us. Some of you, it's like, what is a high dive? I mean, how you stand on the edge of that board, and it's like, you know, eight to ten feet below, and your knees are knocking, and you're just like, can I take the plunge? Can I do this? Can I do it? Do I have what it takes? And then there's peer pressure, you know, that kid coming up the ladder behind you. There's no way you can go back down, and you got to take the plunge. you got to jump off the edge. How many of you remember roaming around in your neighborhood if you lived in a block or a community and roaming around in your neighborhood and there was no cell phone it wasn't like you were gonna you know be called by mama at any point in time and the only rule was what the street lights when the street lights come on your booty better be home right and so you were kind of free to roam the entire neighborhood and the entire community how many of you that was you right yeah, a lot, a lot of us, right? And then how many of you, I'm not advocating this, okay? Not advocating this. How many of you rode in the front seat of a car without a seatbelt and you survived? I am not advocating. We wear our seatbelts in our family, police officers in the room. We wear, Kevin, we wear our seatbelts, okay? In our family, I am not advocating that. But did you know that what, what happens, right? This, this was kind of that reason that you, you didn't really need the seatbelt. A lot of times you were riding with mama and you have to come to that sudden stop. And what does mama do? Bam! Dude, that arm is like superhero power, light and fast. There's no crashes. Nobody gets hurt because you're not penetrating mom's arm. There was no way to break through mom's arm. Now, this is a true story, okay? Did you know that this is actually where the idea from the airbag came from? Did you know that? You know that little, like, that little, when you get older and you're in the grandma age, and that little thing that, like, you know what I'm talking about. You know that little thing that just kind of flaps and hangs below the arm, and it's just kind of shaking, it jiggles a little bit? Okay, I'm not asking you to raise your hand and show me. You know what I'm talking about. So this is a true story. This is where the, where the airbag comes from, right? So a little boy, and he's riding along with his grandmother, and he's in the front seat not wearing his seatbelt because who needs a seatbelt? you got superhero arms over here. All of a sudden, grandma has to make a quick stop, comes to the brake, and instead of it being, it's in slow motion. And that thing just starts to jiggle a little bit. And he goes to fly forward. And nothing penetrates that thing. I mean, come on. True story, right? Not a true story. Don't email me. Don't send me hate mail. If you're grandma and you got one of these things right here, it is a gift from the Lord. Save somebody's life with that thing, okay? It 
comes with wisdom or, or lack of, you know, whatever you want to call it. But the reality is the day and the age, the times and the environments, the cultures, the, the way that our children is growing up is just so much different. And we end up in these positions where we just, we want to remove all of the risk, where we don't want them to risk anything. And so literally on the kids' elementary playgrounds, what are they doing? They're taking the equipment away. No monkey bars because somebody could get hurt. Somebody could break their arm. Literally, we we're going through environments in which kids are trying to take academic tests, and you can't use red ink because red ink will impact their psyche, and they can't handle it. Oh, my goodness. You have times in which you are going through, and everybody is a winner at all times, and there is no such thing as losing. I'm sorry if you've kind of adopted this mindset. It just doesn't work in the Mosley household. It's this, like, everybody is a champ, and so it doesn't matter how good you did or how much effort you put into it. All you had to do is just show up, and you could outright stink, and they're going to give you a giant trophy. Good job, buddy. The way that we are beginning to raise our children and we're reducing the amount of risk that is available to them in their lives, and we've begun to do this thing, and I understand it because we want the best for our children, and I have four little children. We want the best for our children, and so what we're trying to do is reduce the amount of risk or the opportunities that they might be hurt, the opportunities that they might have their feelings hurt or they might be offended, and what we're actually doing is we're handicapping them. We're actually bringing them to a place where they experience atrophy, where they cannot because they're not allowed to risk and potentially experience failure. Now they're in a spot where what happens when they grow up and they're supposed to be grown-ups, now they've never grown up. And then we have this group of people that it's so difficult to experience any kind of failure. And you get to this place where they don't know how to accept the idea that I might not get the job or I might not get into the college or the person that I voted for or didn't vote for got elected into office and now we're going to shut down all the universities and just all cry about it. We're in a position where as a culture and it, and it comes from a good place but we risk too little and we take away the consequences that are meant to be a blessing, that are meant to teach them something. And I'm not advocating that we're not cautious. I, I get it. I, I don't let my kids just have free reign of the whole neighborhood anymore. We can't. The culture, the time has changed. But how far have we gone that now you got to strap on your helmet, put on your elbow pads and your knee pads to just go check the mailbox? And so because we have so sheltered and protected, now we risk too little. And there's another mistake that we make, is that we risk too little and now we rescue too quickly. We just swoop in there and come to the rescue too quickly. We think that we're protecting them from any bad consequences that are going to come in their lives. And yet again, we are crippling them. You've got little Junior and his science project, the one, you know, that he's known about the entire semester, and now it's like the night before, and it's 11 o'clock, and Junior has long since gone to bed, and, and who's being the hero in the moment? Mama is sitting at the, I was Junior. Mama is sitting at the table, and then the next day, hey, the project is just done, and you carry that thing into school, and guess what? They have been rescued to quickly or little Susie forgets her code or she forgets her lunch money and now dad gets off work and he drives the 45 minute commute way out of the way just to show up and provide something and they don't experience any kind of consequence in that moment or they get in trouble at school and you come alongside and my little Johnny would never do that he would never behave that way and what we end up doing is we end up rescuing them too quickly. And it feels like the hero thing. Come on, moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas. It feels like the right thing to do. It feels like I love them, so I want to do this for them. So I'm going to swoop in and I'm going to rescue them in that moment. 
Now, can I ask you a question? The prodigal son, you remember the story, the prodigal son? When the prodigal son had squandered everything, when he had spent it all, when he had ran out and had partied hard, he had lived hard, what did the father not do? He did not run after him. He did not rescue him. Why did the father who loves his son, who is the model picture parable for us, why did he not run after him? Why did he not rescue him? There are consequences attached that sometimes when we come in and we rescue too quickly, we've denied them the opportunity to experience consequences and even painful ones that ultimately lead to pivots in their life. And we have come in and we have rescued too quickly. And the third thing that we do is that we reward too frequently. And this is a tough one for me. And again, this one, this one all comes from the same mindset. I want them, every generation before it, wants the next generation to have it better than what they had. I want my kids to go further than I've ever gone. I want them to have things that I never had. And so one generation looks at the next generation, and because of that, because of something that is good in their heart, because of some, there, there are good motives, sometimes it ends up that you reward too frequently, and that we actually end up giving them things that they should earn. And what do we end up with? Spoiled, entitled children. Spoiled, entitled young adults and grown adults. Kid who's age seven, given an allowance, not because they worked for it, but they're just given an amount of money no matter what they do every single week, right? That's where a lot of us started off. That same kid turns 10 years old, and what do they do? They get the $100 pair of sneakers. Why? Because every other kid has those shoes. Kid grows up, and they turn 16 years old, and now what do they get? They get the car. We give them the car. Kid goes on, and he has never earned any bit of it. It has been handed out to them, and they've never had to strive for something. They've never had to work hard at something. Everything has been handed to them, and now when they grow up, they are not prepared because life does not operate that way. And you know it, and I know it, because now you are living it. And yet we have a responsibility that when children are coming up, that we risk too little sometimes, we rescue too quickly, and we reward too frequently. And these children then now, because I deserve this, not because I've earned it, but because I deserve it, I expect it, you owe it, society, culture, you owe it to me. Now they're 24 years old, and this is the epidemic that's happening. I am entitled to the same lifestyle that my parents had, even though I haven't put in the hard work, even though they worked for 30 years to make it happen, and now how do I deal with it? Because nobody's handing it to me. I pull out my credit card, and now I find myself upside down in debt, and I'm swimming up to my eyeballs. And this is the responsibility sits with you and me. There are a lot of things. Listen, sometimes we're looking at the next generations and we're pointing out all of these holes that are sitting millennial generation and then we spout off all of these things, the Gen Xers or the Gen Yers. We are the ones who have been training up our children and we've been paving the path. Now I say there's a tremendous value in these generations. Social justice causes within them unlike any before us. But yet, you and I, sometimes we look at the faults, and when we need to be looking back and saying, have we done these things? Are we doing these things? And the problem is this. The thing that we struggle with as a parent, as a grandparent, the thing we struggle with is that we worship at the altar of happiness. I love my kids. I want the very best for them. I just want them to be happy. Whatever it takes. I love seeing that smile on their face. 
I hate it when they're crying or when they're pitching a fit. We worship at the altar of happiness. I want my kids to be happy because God wants me to be happy, right? It says, be happy because I am happy. That's what it says, right? No, that's not what it says. It says this. It says, be holy because I am holy. And sometimes we get this so confused. We get so concerned with what happiness looks like, what we are entitled to, even as parents, even as grandparents. Our concerns become with our happiness, and therefore we will justify anything that we choose to do because this is the decision that makes me happy. And holiness is not a part of the equation. And yet for you and I, who are responsible for influencing the next generation, we need to be able to look and point people at the character of God who's transforming you, who's transforming me, and says, be holy because I am holy. It's holiness over happiness. And what ultimately ends up is happy. Can we just get rid of the word happy and can we insert joy in here? That's another thing for another day. But joy, contentment, fulfillment, then becomes a byproduct of a life that is fulfilled because you're honoring the Lord. And in that place, then sustainable joy, not fleeting happiness. And here's the thing. We need to worry less about today's happiness and more about tomorrow's readiness. You got this? Parents, grandparents, have influence with children. You need to be more concerned with tomorrow's readiness than you are about this fleeting moments of happiness. And I know it's difficult. I know the goodness of your heart. I know what you want to do. I know you want to lavish over them. But how does it prepare them for who God is calling them to be, the character that they are to have? And so three mistakes that parents make. We risk too little, we rescue too quickly, we reward too frequently. And so how do we do this differently? If we were to have a lasting impression on the next generation, what does it look like for me? And what does it look like for you? How do we prepare the next generation? And I would say that we go right where we were last week, that we would begin with the end in mind, that we would look out into the future and find the desired results, the thing that we want for our children the most. What does that look like, and now how do we reverse engineer it? Ultimately, we would begin to define by asking the question, what is success? And this is important, and, and this kind of varies from family to family, and uh, honestly, it varies a lot between the cultural definition of success and what you and I, especially if you would call yourself a Christ follower, would define success. Culture would define success, success this way. It's raising well-rounded, well-educated, happy kids. Give me a nod if you, if you would say that that's kind of a good definition that culture would look at and say, you know what, that's a great idea, that my kids would grow up to be well-rounded that they would be well-educated, that they would be happy kids. And there, there's some problems, there's some holes in this definition, and ultimately I think that we have a completely definition, a different definition within the church, but just easy to shoot holes in. The person who grows up that is well-rounded, that's the jack of all trades, like I know a little bit about a lot of things. Do you know what they're not? They're not specializing in any one thing. You're not finding that thing that God has uniquely purposed and created them for, who he has equipped them for, he's called them to, he's anointed them to do. You've skipped all of that and said, you know what? I know you're probably not great at mathematics, so let's just round you out in everything just so you can have a general approach to it all. That doesn't work very well. Well-educated, that's a great goal in mind. You can grow up in the best universities. You can have the, all of the knowledge come to you here. But what happens when it is an intellectual, cognitive processing, and yet you've missed the most important things when character and integrity are abandoned? Where is that in the definition of success? And happy kids. We just talked about happy kids. It's e easy to shoot a hole in that. And so for us, I believe that we have a different working definition. And so I would say it this way, that for us, as Christians, this is what it would say. We are called to unleash Christ-centered, biblically-anchored world changers. 
Could, could we say this together? And this, this is a mouthful, okay? We are called to unleash Christ-centered, biblically-anchored world changers. I don't know if all of you are there with me yet. Let's one more time, okay? On three. One, two, three. We are called to unleash Christ-centered, biblically-anchored world changers. Christ-centered. How you define success will ultimately determine how you parent your children, influence your children, grandchildren. And so, Christ-centered, what would it look like that, that I would view the world, not from the framework of how every else, everybody else defines what is right and wrong, how culture leads me down a direction, but our children would grow up in such a way that they would view the world through the Christian lens, that they would view the world through Scripture and God's design. What would that look like? What would it be that in, so, in, in an environment that it is so difficult to take a stand for any one truth, that all truth is relative, that you decide what's right for you, I'll decide what's right for me. What would it look like for our children to grow up in such a way that they would be biblically anchored, holding on to it? What would it look like for our kids to grow up believing that God will use them, equip them, call them, purpose them to be world changers? World changers even in their local community. World changers that it doesn't start one day when you walk out and you own your own and you own some business or you have some platform. World changers when you're in the classroom. World changers when you're in the school bus. World changers when you're sitting alongside mama and dad and friction gets heated and they're able to speak into that situation. What would it look like to raise children this way? That we are called to unleash Christ-centered, biblically-anchored world changers. And this is a, this is a great thing to just kind of have as like a, uh, a mission statement, vision statement for your family, for your children. It's a lot harder to begin to like, how do I apply this? In fact, you already start to give a little pushback. You're like, hey, that's a great idea. You know, world changers, living for Jesus, I'm all for that. But you're push, I'm just trying to keep the lights on. I'm just trying to keep the bills paid. Do you know how fast they grow out of their sneakers how many times? I'm just trying to make ends meet. And you want to talk about influencing them for world changing? I understand. Sometimes it can be a little bit intimidating because you know, my children have grown up and I made my share of mistakes and I didn't do everything right and now there's guilt and condemnation and maybe I'm not even qualified to influence another generation because of where my children have been or how things have turned out. Again, as we've said, you are now uniquely qualified to speak into circumstances in a way that none of the rest of us could because you've been there and you have experienced it. Honestly, guys, sometimes, sometimes we look into you know, a, a life like mine and it and it's like okay you're pastoring a church of course your children should be behaving this way or acting this way and we are so far from perfect and having that stuff all together and all figured out in fact i'm learning from a lot of you who are investing who have gone further in a different point than than where we are but the reality is is sometimes we just we, we relocate those things to you know that's the preacher's family the way that they should live or that's this family over here for us it's too big of a struggle and what i want to do today is i, I want to make this practical and i want to bring it to a position where it is very very simple for us and what does that look like how do we leave a lasting impression how do we impact the next generation and, and so if you were in sales or you were in business you you may recognize this acrostic here that this would be kiss, right? Say that with me. One, two, three. Kiss. All right. Now kiss your neighbor, okay? Uh, and, and so you may remember what this was if you were ever in sales. It's keep it simple. Yeah, and that can be a, even an offensive word that we try to remove from everything, right? It's keep it simple, stupid, but just so I don't offend you today for no reason, let's say keep it simple, silly, okay? All right. Nobody's feelings hurt? You need a tissue? All right. So keep it simple, silly. There is power in simplicity. Sometimes such a daunting mission, vision statement for being world changers, that's really hard to like, okay, now what do I do? How do I live this out? And so this will help us out, moms, dads, and grandmas, and grandpas, and those who are having influence. And I want us to talk from the position that we would come to where we are managing 
environments where we would be managing exposures, the, the places in which our kids are, uh, are, are living and dwelling and, and, and growing up, the environments that they find themselves in, that we would manage the exposures. Because here's what I believe, and you know this to be true, that what we expose our children, the next generation to, helps determine who they become. What we expose them to helps to influence and point them on the path to who they're going to become. I mean, it's a basic principle that if I'm really into sports and I love baseball or I love Georgia football, go dogs yesterday, if I love those things, then guess what? My children come plop next to me on the bed and now they're being influenced and the probably is they're going to grow up wearing red and black, right? If you're really into sports or maybe you're into, you know, great quality education, you've influenced them that way, then later on they're probably going to be lifelong learners, if you have exposed them to different things, ultimately those things kind of start to make the path for where they're going to go. Basic idea, you get this idea, okay? Proverbs 13, 20 says something similar in, in idea. He says, whoever walks with the wise becomes what? Becomes wise. But the companion of fools will do what? They will suffer harm. It's another way of saying what you and I are already talking about. That if you're walking with the right friends that are going to have influences in your life. If you're in the right environment, it's going to point you in a certain direction. If you're in bad environments, guess what? Your life is going to start headed in that direction. We know that to be true. And I'd say yes, because I lived it in high school. And so our children, we manage the exposure. And what happens? We, we don't get the opportunity to, to filter every one of those environments, every one of those exposures. The reality is they're going to have bad influences that come into their life, negative influences. Maybe it's in the things that pop up on the television in an overly indulged sexual culture. Maybe it's something that they hear about on the school bus, or maybe it's something uh, where somebody is expressing prejudices or bullying them. And it goes on and on and on. And the reality is it's that we cannot force them to love Jesus. We can't just beat our kids over the head and say, you know what, Jesus is the answer. So what do you do? How do you do that? How do you begin to live that out? Well, there's a few different ways that we can manage the exposure. The first one is this, is that we expose the next generation to the joy of knowing God personally, of knowing God personally. In John 17, this is Jesus, and he's quoted here. Now this is eternal life, that they would know you, the only true God, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And this is really important the idea of knowing you. And this isn't an intellectual thing. This is a heart thing. That they would have a real relationship. That they would view this as relationship. And ultimately what happens too often than not is because either A, we're, we're, we're busy, we believe what we believe, we're Christians, we love Jesus, but maybe there's a little bit of disconnect in how we're influencing our children or the next generation. What happens is that this thing becomes about rules, 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 rules. And we miss this idea of knowing God personally, that it's a personal relationship. And when we miss that, what happens is that rules without relationship leads to rebellion over and over and over again. Rules without relationship leads to rebellion. And so we might have the best intention. This is the way we're going to do it in my home. This is the biblical standard. This is what we're going to do. And we'll set rule after rule after rule, and we'll expect them to obey it. In fact, we'll push that on them. And yet, when it's without relationship, it ultimately leads to rebellion. And there's a very famous passage of Scripture in Deuteronomy, and you may remember this, uh, especially it speaks a lot about what legacy is for us, responsibilities for the next generation. I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly. Here it is. These are the commands, the decrees, and the laws the Lord God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you're crossing the Jordan to possess. And so right out the gate here, they're about to cross over into the promised land, and there are some boundaries, some guidelines that God has set up and that he wants them to know about. Why does he want them to know about it? So that you, your children, and their children, that this becomes a generational thing. This becomes a legacy thing. So that you and your children and their children that are coming after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all of his decrees and commands that I give you. 
so that you may enjoy long life. Enjoy life. Have joy. Have happiness. Be fulfilled. Have contentment. And so he begins to say to them that you are to uh, give these commands to allow them to be on your hearts. Next slide. And this is important. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Can I just be honest that, that some of this and some of the gap and what we're looking to do as far as how we raise up in the next generation begins with this, what's in our own heart or what's not in our own heart. And so the biggest thing, the biggest opportunity that the next generation has is to look into your life and your personal relationship, something that is inside of your heart that you should be impressing on them, that you should be imparting to them. And how do you do that? Well, they keep it simple, silly. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. Talk about them when you're driving in your car or when you're sitting at the dinner table. Talk about these things when you lie down, when you're getting ready to put the kids to bed. Talk about these things. And when you get up and you're beginning your next day, talk about these things. Keep reading. Tie them as symbols around your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your heart and on your gates. And so the opportunity for us is, is to make this a personal thing. It requires first and foremost that it must be in our hearts that then we can impress it into the next generation. It does not happen without that. And so continue reading here. He jumps on down and he says, in the future... So right now, if your kids are young, they may not understand. In the future, when that time comes, they may look back and they may ask you an important question like this. When your son asks you, what is the meaning for these stipulations, these decrees and the laws? What's the reason why you just kept talking about this stuff? Why did you live your life this way? Your life looks so different than everybody else, all of my friends' lives. Why? Why is it different? And when they ask you this question, you tell them that we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord. And this, my friends, is so significant that your story matters so much. It is so much more profound than, here's what the book says. When you begin living out your story, telling your story, think about who this is. This is the Israelites who had been bound up in slavery, who had been beaten, who had been whipped and cracked into submission, who did not know freedom. And they said, when that time comes and our children begin to ask us, why do we live so differently? Why does it look so differently? I'll tell them, I once was. Oh, but I am no longer. And why? But the Lord. These are first-person stories, first-person accounts. So what is your story? Have you forgotten where you came from, what the Lord has done in your life? How can you impress that on the next generation if we have left that thing behind? For us, it is a good thing to be reminded so that we can impress it on our children. And this is simple. Keep it simple, silly. This is simple stuff. While we're going throughout our day, while we're talking about normal life, while we're in, can I just tell you practically some of the things? And again, like we have, we have no claim to even doing this the right way. I'm still learning here, okay? But but some of the things that we're doing in our lives is when when there's an opportunity that something good comes up. Every time we deflect it and we point it back, look at how good the Lord is. Look at what God has done. We sit down with our children and we consider the roof over our head. Look at how God has blessed us. And I'll go so far as to even tell them the story when it was just me and my mama. Listen, we couldn't even keep the lights on. Remember, we couldn't take a shower before school. Look at what the Lord has done. And when you find those opportunities, those little blessings that come along, don't miss the moments. Don't take the glory in. Deflect it. Point your children at this. Look at how God has blessed us. Look at how God has blessed you. 
as you're going through your day, as you're going through your way, making opportunities, looking, being intentional. This isn't difficult. It's simple, but it does require that you are intentional. We have a high value in, in my home that our children would have a personal relationship with Jesus. I hope you have that as well. We've been praying that over them since they were in the womb. God, let them come to know you at an early age. Let your word be written upon their hearts that we're praying that over them, that we're asking for God's blessing in this area. But can I tell you, can I, can I just tell you something? Don't, you can judge, you can think. We don't have like a formal sit-down prayer time. There's not like a scheduled time when it's like, hey, at this time we're going to have this great home. But what we do is as we live, it's a position of continuously praying. As we're going, as we're doing, God, thank you for this. One of them scrapes their knee and gets a little boo-boo. What are we going to do? We're going to pray over that. One of them can't sleep at night. They're having nightmares. What are we going to do? We're going to pray over that. And we find these opportunities, these moments to have these spiritual conversations. And maybe your children are in different places of life. You still find those moments. You look for those places. And sometimes you would think, okay, you know, pastor's home, they have these, these prayer meetings. And can I just be real? Like, when we're praying, it's still that, like, she's peeking. How do you know she was peeking? Because you're a hypocrite. You were peeking at her peeking. <laughs> he hit me. It's my turn to pray. He's putting his feet on me. It's just life. And sometimes we make this thing into something that it doesn't have to be. This is simple. This is us living out our faith that begins in our own hearts, that is revealed to our children in how we are living. And you know this, and I know this, and we're borrowing from a phrase, that faith is caught much more than it is taught. That in, in our home, that we actually want them to catch us praying. Yes. Yes. Praying passionately in my kitchen, crying, weeping, calling out to the Lord. Not because my children, but I know they are there. My son comes to me and says, Daddy, what are you doing? Why, why, why are you crying? And I have a moment. I have an opportunity. And I believe it's these things. And maybe I get 10 of them between here and, and he's on his own. But it's these things that sets a foundation, that this isn't some like, you know, Bible off in the distance. My dad believes this. He lives this. It changed him. And there are some things that, listen, you want, you want your stories to be age appropriate, okay? So you, you decide, you have a filter, and you make whatever decision that is good for you and your family. But there are some things, some places, some darkness, some exposure, some things that I'm not proud of in my life. But I'll tell you that I'm going to have the conversation with my children, and I'm going to tell them. Not because of glorifying anything, but because I want them to see the power of God at work in my life. I once would this, but the Lord changed me into this. You don't have to go where I have gone. You don't have to experience what I have experienced. And so we find ways of investing, of having the conversation, of leaving legacies for our children just by the way that we model it, that it is better, that it is caught, rather than we sit down and we try to teach it all. When you live it out in front of them, we sometimes have the biggest injustice. And this, this, is, a, this is just a, a conviction of mine, that if we are going to, if I'm going to raise up my children and I'm going to teach these things if we're going to pastor a church and they're going to know that my daddy is a pastor and yet I deny the power of God operating in my life and in my home, then I have become the biggest hypocrite in the biggest stumbling block to their faith that they will ever hear. It won't be the televangelist on TV. It won't be the person down the street. It will be because they saw a gap between what I professed and what I lived. And we, my friends, my friends, we have a great responsibility for the next generation. 
I am convinced that the next generation, statistics say that they're moving away from faith, moving away from church, and I am convinced that it is not a moving away from Christ himself. It is a moving away from some rules and regulations. It is a moving away from a gap of hypocrisy that has happened within our faith and our lives. We have great responsibility for the next generation that is coming behind us. We manage the exposure, we manage the culture, we manage the environments that our kids find themselves in, and then we manage the exposure to the next generation, to the presence and the power of God in his church. And I'm going to talk about this specifically for a moment, okay, and I'll be brief about this is that there is a tremendous value, and I don't know where you sit, and it's not my value because I'm a pastor in a church. There is a tremendous value in my family and in my heart for the church, for this right here. Not this building, not this location, but for you, for you, for you, for you, and for me and how God has woven us together to be a part of a community by design intentional community, that God puts something, he does something significant, and I can't explain that when your faith is partnered with my faith, something ignites within us, and that God is present in those moments. And so we come into a place like this, and we're changed, not because of what one person said, but because of the spirit behind it. We're changed, not because of lyrics that are sung, but because of the spirit that dwells within it. There is something significant that happens within the church that God designed, that he put in motion. And yet, and yet, do you know a question that is never asked in my home? My children do not, not because we don't tell them not to, they do not ask the question, are we going to church? There are some things in our life that are non-negotiables. You have them, I have them. It is a non-negotiable that I get up and I go to work. It's a non-negotiable that my kid is in karate. Do you know how much we pay for karate? You're going to go to karate and you're going to be fantastic at karate. There are some things that are non-negotiables. You've got that ball game, you made that commitment, you're going to be there. This is a non-negotiable. We don't even need to talk about it. And yet Sunday rolls around and the question on Saturday night becomes, should we go to church tomorrow? And there's a, there's a gap, and I, and I don't mean this in guilt and condemnation, there's just a gap that exists within our culture because somewhere we've lost the value of what it means to do life with one another. We talk about it a lot. But somewhere there's some part of it that's missing. And I would say to you that if this becomes that so many other things are non-negotiable and yet we make this part of it negotiable, what do you think that communicates to the next generation about the value of something that God orchestrated and put in place? What do you think? What does it say? Do not forsake the gathering of the saints. Come together. And so we model the way. This is taught rather than caught. We can say it with our mouths and do something differently, and man, oh man, do they read through the action. And so we manage, we're conscious of, we're aware of, of how we're exposing our children to the presence of God, to the power of God, specifically and uniquely, both in our home and in our Church, that if we are called to unleash Christ centered, biblically anchored world changers, then part of this is figuring out the unique purposes, finding our fit within the church, finding the way that God has designed us. And I just, you know, off the notes here, just, I just want to say thank you to those who serve in our church in the next generation. I want to say thank you specifically to those of you who are often, I see you all the time, some of you are wearing green shirts right now, that you serve our children, you serve my children. And I just wanna tell you, and I don't get to say it often enough, that my children are, are growing up and, and they're inheriting a legacy that you are imparting into them. They're learning something from you that I cannot teach them because I am daddy. And yet they look in your life and they see you living it out and they see you investing into them. And I just want to say thank you. And not just for my kids, but for all of the kids of our church. And so could we just put our hands together and say thank you.
thank you. And so the church should be a priority in our life. And I don't mean to, I'm not trying to drive guilt on this. The third way is this, is expose the next generation to the thrill of being used by God. The thrill of being used by God. And have you ever been used by God? Have you ever felt like that God did something? And this is just mind-blowing. It's baffling. How can the God who spoke everything into existence, how can the creator of the universe, how can he do something through a broken vessel, a broken individual like me? How and why? It blows my mind, but he chooses to partner with people. He moves through people. He does something in you so he can do something through you. Have you experienced that in your life? The thrill of being used by God. You're having conversation with someone, and you feel this little butterfly in here. Maybe I should pray for them. And you pray over that individual. You're in some sort of counseling conversation. They're just kind of bending your ear. Here's what's going on in my life. And there's some kind of wisdom wrapped in some anointing that God is speaking something through you. And now you're, whoa, that was pretty good. I should write that down myself. To be used by God. Now, what would it look like? Shouldn't we be exposing the next generation to the thrill of being used by God? That God himself would be moving through their lives. Not when they're grown adults, but out of the mouths of babes would they speak. That our children, and this is, this is practical, guys. This is practical. This isn't like, okay, you yeah, know, great. This requires that you look into the hearts of your that we look into the hearts of the next generation. Instead of asking the question of success, what does well-rounded look like? Pfft, that out the wind. Looking into the heart of the individual and identifying uniquely, specifically, how God has shaped them and wired them and equipped them, who he has called them to be, who he is making them to be. And if you have children, you've been around children, you know that it is hardwired within them. They are all different. And they all have different skills, and they all have different things. And I look into my daughter, and she's still young, but there is something inside of her. And I'm having conversation with her the other, other day, and I, you take this for what it's worth. I'm not trying to over-spiritualize this. I believe that God has put something inside of her, that she's going to speak words to others that she does not know. And that God is raising her up. And I see the evidence at 10 years old. So you want to test the fruit? I see the evidence. And so I begin speaking to that in the car. This wasn't some planned conversation. This is just being intentional about raising up the next generation, about investing into a legacy. Hey, baby, I, I just want you to know that I, I see something in your heart. And I, I think God wants to do, did you know that God can move through you? You know those times? Yeah, Daddy, I know those times. But this is what God might do even more in your life if you would be willing to continue to grow in him and learn in him. I see something inside of my son, a level of love for other people and compassion and empathy for those who are broken and hurting. A way in which our, we pass somebody on the street and there's an ambulance and I might just be too busy. And he says, Daddy, we should pray right now. And so I see something and we develop that and we foster that in our children. Now, our other two, one of them is so crazy, I don't even know what to do with her. <laughs> She's only four. But the, the reality is, guys, it, is that we get to uniquely look into the lives of our children and identify how God has shaped them and wired them, that we are stewards of this parenting and grandparenting process. And then we get to say, God, what have you created? And how do you want me to come and help alongside that? That this is an intentional process of impartation and impressing upon the next generation. It's an opportunity that you and I have. It's an opportunity, it's a responsibility. And we don't just get to bypass this and ignore it. And so, one of the things that I am convinced of, and we're, we're concluding here, but we're also concluding the whole series, and just, just as a whole for a moment. So I am convinced of this, that it is not enough in my life that living to make my mark, living for Daniel to have influence, living to find my own successes, it is not enough for me to live to make my mark that I would give my life to. But that we get 
It's a privilege. It's an honor. It's, it's something that we have the opportunity to do, that we get to be a part of a much greater story, God's story through us, where Jesus is at work in the world around us. And my life is going to come and go. I had another birthday yesterday. My life is going to come and go. But there's something eternal that we get to be a part of. And that it requires you and I slowing down long enough, thinking hard enough, keeping it simple enough that we might would be intentional about the legacy that we leave, about whose mark that we make, that it would not be about my own, that it would be about Christ who lives and dwells within us. That at the end of my days, when my time comes, I'm going to go before my wife. I don't know if you know that, Jake. When I'm 138 years old, that you know, I'm, I'm there on my bed and my, my wife is standing by my side and my children are gathered around and their children are gathered around and their children are gathered around and when you're 138, I guess you get multiple five generations. And it, it wouldn't be the sermons that I preached. It wouldn't be the little things that I post on Instagram or Facebook quotes that I ripped off from somebody else. It would be a legacy of individuals who are following in footsteps. And I made mistakes. But when I made those mistakes, I simply used them as an opportunity to teach. Here's the faithfulness of God. Here's where I went wrong. Here's where God was faithful when I was faithless. There's a generations of children who are now calling their faith their own, not because I forced it, not because of some religious responsibility, because they have a personal. I think that would be a pretty good way to go. And for you, the question is not if you're going to leave a legacy. It's what legacy will you leave? pray with you. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, that you would consider us worthy of being a part in your greater story, that individually our, our lives may not amount to a whole lot, but you invite us into a much bitter, bigger overarching story. And Lord, I pray that somehow that we might would become mindful of what it is that you're wanting to do through us. That, Lord, that you would teach us to put aside selfish tendencies and that we begin looking at our lives as a treasure that could be invested. Father, I pray for the next generation who is following in our footsteps. God, would we, with your grace, somehow model the way in, in such a way that our faith would be contagious and that they would take it and run further and faster than we ever did. Father, I thank you. Your word says that eternity is bound in the hearts of men. I thank you that legacy is written within us. God, would you help us to not keep it in the distant future, but to be intentional about it on a day-to-day -day basis. If you're here in the room today and, and you would say, you know, Pastor Daniel, through this series, either today or another week during this series, is something about this idea of legacy has really been speaking to me, and, and God is, is showing me, he's calling me to begin to be more intentional about how I'm shaping those around me, how I'm influencing those around me. And I want you to know, I want God to know that my life will be about investing into others. If God has been prompting your heart, would you, with every head bow and every eye closed in the room, would you raise your hand at this moment? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, do something inside of these hearts, the hands that were raised, and they saying, here I am, God. Here I am, God. Use me. And I thank you for that. And if you're here today and you would say, you know what, this whole idea that it starts with knowing God, it starts with this personal relationship with God, 
Yeah, I, I heard that story before. I, I know that Jesus died for my sins, but that's it. I, I know it in my mind. I know the account, but I've never known that in my heart. If you're here today, maybe a friend invited you, maybe a family member invited you, and you would say, you know what? I'm a long ways from that. I have my share of junk in my heart and my life, and I just... Listen, I, I understand that. I was right there myself. And I was in a church environment, much like what you're in today. Some guy told me about how my life could be different, but it required that I submitted myself to Jesus, which really meant, God, I need you. Would you change me? Would you help me? Would you come into my life and make me different? I can't pray that for you, but if you pray that, God is faithful to come into your heart and to bring transformation in your life. It simply is saying, God, forgive me of my sins, make me new, wash me clean. Help me, God, from this day forward to live my life differently. With your grace, my life will forever be changed. If you'll pray that, he's faithful to do that. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name.